For thousands of years, the people of the Andes have worshipped deities of the heavens, earth, and underworld in temples and mystical holy places. Though Spanish conquistadors looted in savage conquest, they could not destroy holy ground, the sacred sites where people and spirits met and continue to meet to this day. Join Jim Burroughs, Andean folklorist Jack Throckmorton, and the people of the Andes as they trek to ancient sacred sites, sites of human sacrifice, celestial observatories, and sacred communion with the ancient gods of this land. The Andes Mountains, mythical home of the gods, their jagged peaks point a cloud-shrouded path to the Bolivian capital of La Paz. At 12,000 feet, La Paz is the highest capital city in the New World. Its name means City of Peace. La Paz would be our base as we search for sacred sites in the surrounding areas. We had come to Bolivia with an old friend, Jack Throckmorton, a Latin American folk historian and expert in local traditions. Tell me a little bit about your background, Jack. What, what's brought you here on a quest like this? You know, one of my principal motives for returning was to see for myself, to learn for myself, is whether some of the ancient beliefs still existed among these people. Because you've got to see for yourself, don't you? And it's going to be profoundly interesting to see how much, if any, of these very ancient beliefs exist, or if they exist at all, in what form. In the heart of Old La Paz is the Mercado de las Brujas, which is the market of the witches, a place not found on uh, tourist maps and guidebooks. To get there, we decided to follow the Chola women, those ladies with those very distinctive bowler hats and those wide pleated skirts uh, as they were on their way to open their stalls early in the morning. The market of the witches is where one comes to buy llama fetuses and magical herbs to use in ceremonies and offerings. It is the marketplace of the Yatiri, the wise men of the Aymara people. The market of the witches is a very vivid and clear example of the ancient ways and the ancient cultures coexisting with modern civilization. Obviously, the uh, presence of a Western camera crew was something that they resented. Several of them closed their stalls. Others would turn their backs to us. One of them actually was able to bean our cameraman <laughs> with an onion. Not everything sold here is legal. You can buy skins here of rare or even endangered animals, animals that we would have preferred to see alive. When you leave the Street of the Witches, you leave a secret part of La Paz. And when you're back in your four-star hotel, you wonder if the typical tourist even knows that such a place can exist. With Nemesio Chui, our guide, we would search for Inca sacred sites where pilgrims and priests had once gathered. A rickety old ferry would take us across fabled Lake Titicaca to Cavalry Hill in the town of Copacabana. The lake bottom, 1,500 feet down, is littered with sacred offerings from ancient times, and cars, buses, and trucks fallen from ferries capsized by sudden squalls. This is a beautiful but dangerous place. The Maceo didn't seem the least bit worried. Because our cause was good, he said, the spirits would be with us.
Copacabana is a short drive from the ferry dock. Even from the road, the twin peaks of Cavalry Hill are easy to spot. The Maceo wanted us to receive the blessings of the Apacuna, the Inca spirits of Cavalry Hill, before continuing on. On Cavalry Hill, the old religion and the new exist side by side. We walked on ancient Inca steps to a high holy place. The Spanish put 12 crosses on either side of the path, representing the Christian stations of the cross. For centuries, worshipers left stones on altars to pay their respects to the mountain spirits. Apparently, they do the same today. The Spanish, throughout the days of conquest, uh, always looked uh, upon the indigenous American peoples uh, as subhuman, almost animalistic. Uh, and their excuse for the suppression, of course, uh, was that they were bringing them the true religion, Christianity. As a sign of devotion, pilgrims walk the hill barefoot. On the days before Easter, some will crawl to the top on their hands and knees. The new religion did not replace the old. Instead, the two merged to become one. Worshippers on a Christian pilgrimage walk on Inca stones, leading to an Inca holy place that is now a Christian holy place. The cross itself has both Christian and Inca meaning. Christ is worshipped here, along with the more ancient spirits. Standing atop this Christianized hill, I found it really very ironic to be able to look over Lake Titicaca, the very birthplace of Viracocha, the sun god, the principal god of the Incas. In ancient times, reed boats crisscrossed Lake Titicaca, ferrying pilgrims and priests to the sacred islands of the sun and the moon. For thousands of years, craftsmen gathered the totora reeds that grew along the shore. Legend has it that the design of the boats was revealed to the Inca people by Viracocha, the sun god. Paulino Estaban is the last of the reed boat builders. When he dies, a tradition of many thousands of years will die with him. It's the strongest, you know? It's like a, a wire. It's like a wire. Two bulls. Yeah, sure. Okay. We were watching the construction of what may be the very last reed boat ever made. Commissioned by the Bolivian Navy, the boat will be placed in a museum. It will never touch water. Sadly, the plans and methods for reed boat construction exist in one place only. He's saying that the plans are in his head. Because reed boats last only a few months before becoming waterlogged, people now prefer modern boats of wood and fiberglass. There is little need for Paolino's special knowledge today. It will die with him. also opted for speed over beauty, a modern boat over ancient waters. We wanted to see the Isla del Sol, Isle of the Sun, the legendary birthplace of the Incas. 
The Maceo told us about a ruin at the southern end of the island, a place called Pil Kakaino. Legend has it that this is where Manco Capac, the first Inca king, was born. We expected to see the ruins of a large temple, but from the boat it looked like little more than a stone hut. It was from this island in the 13th century that Manco Capac set out to conquer the Aymara, Wari, and the other peoples of the region to create the most advanced civilization of the Americas, the great empire of the Inca. The Inca empire has always fascinated Jack Throckmorton. Isla del Sol was the birthplace of Inca religion and Inca culture. This was the place where Viracocha first appeared to the ancient people who then became the Incas and established uh, their culture and religion. Pilgrims came here by the thousands to worship at the sacred rock of origins from which the great god Viracocha created the sun and the moon. It's easy to see why the rock, the island, and the lake were named Titicaca, the Quechua name for jaguar, a most powerful spirit to these indigenous peoples. There are ruins all over the island, perhaps the homes of priests who guarded the sacred rock. In Inca times, mummies of priests were propped up in these niches. They had all the rights of the living, including the right to own property. The Inca practiced human sacrifice, perhaps in stone pits like these. It is said that Viracocha, the sun god, commanded the first Inca to leave Isla del Sol and go to the northern wilderness to search for the center of the world. He carried a golden staff and pushed it into the ground wherever he stopped to rest. At one place, his staff sank deep into the earth. That place he declared Cusco, the navel of the world, the capital of the Inca Empire. When the Spanish came a century later, they found a city of gold. Even its walls were covered in gold plating. They looted the city of all of this wealth, some 24 tons of gold, and shipped it off to Spain. Then they tore down the Inca temples and built Christian churches on top of the ancient foundations. Where once stood the Temple of the Sun, its exquisite curved walls covered in gold, now stands the convent of Santo Domingo. The conquistadors hoped to annihilate Inca culture and religion by destroying their holy places. It seemed to have worked, at least on the surface. All of the cathedrals are built right on top of Incan sites. Site after site, place after place that we have visited, and any other place that I know of in the Andes, you will see the superimposition of Catholic religious culture immediately above sacred Incan sites. And you can imagine the psychological effect that this must have had on the Inca people. Somehow Cusco survived the Spanish invader. Today, its ancient roads and walkways face the challenges of the 20th century.
Here we said goodbye to Nemesio and met with Romulo Valencia. Romulo had one place he especially wanted us to see. We are going to go to the south of Cusco, which is a beautiful landscape around. The energy positive is waiting for us. Romulo is a very interesting guy. He's a native Quechua. He's a man who very early in his life saw something good in his culture that he wanted to protect. We climbed higher and higher, away from paved roads, to one of the most mysterious sacred places of the Inca Empire, deep in the Andean wilderness. Okay, welcome to Tipong. This was a place so remote that few ventured to see it. Tipon, where water from melting glaciers was channeled to the farms and villages far below, and still is today. We were joined by a group of pilgrims who had also climbed to this place of great spiritual significance. It's impossible not to realize that you are literally walking in the footsteps of the ancient Inca kings and priests. I wasn't the only one who felt that we were being watched by the spirits of the ancient Incas. This was a water distribution center, precisely built by the Incas to direct water down the mountainside to crops grown on different terrace levels. Since water was a gift from the gods, this too was a sacred place. Here, looks like that the ancient Peruvians played with water, building canals, aqueducts, you know, so the water engineers were working here for a long time ago. Tipong is the name of this sacred place. In Quechua language, we call the water Unu. Unu means the sacred water. It's absolutely amazing when you think about it, how the Incas were able to move water from these mountain streams to villages and fields hundreds of miles away in the valley. Water is scarce in this rugged terrain, and to the Inca, water was life. It was both utilized and worshiped as a gift from the gods. Tipon is one of the most important ritual place to worship water. Today, as in the past, holy men come to Tipon to make offerings to Pachamama, mother goddess of the earth, in return for her gift of water. Musicians perform when no one is around to hear them, no one, that is, but the spirits. Music is their offering.
we returned to our van and left Tipon on a road overlooking the sacred valley of the Inca. The Urubamba River really is the Nile of the Incas. It still nourishes the local villages, most of which predate even the Inca. The little village where we stopped seemed virtually unchanged for hundreds of years, though here and there, the modern world had made some headway. <laughs> Quechua women sold us the same kinds of fruits and vegetables that their ancestors had once sold to the Spanish, including varieties found nowhere else on earth. It's always a pleasure to be among the Quechua on a market day. Their warmth and genuine friendliness is something that stays with you even after you leave. Overlooking the Sacred Valley is an ancient ruin known as Pisac. Pisac's a place without any written history. There are no records from the Spanish but the stones can speak volumes. If you look at this incredibly fine and detailed stonework, it's obvious that it's a place of significance. Inca builders probably left this older structure because it had some kind of great religious significance to the pre-Columbian peoples. Here again were niches in the walls, carved to hold mummies of the high priests. A gate to the east, a doorway for Viracocha, the sun god. At the highest point is a stone post. Here, in this temple of the sun, there is a protuberance which is the Intihuatana, or the hitching post of the sun. Here, the ancient Andean astronomers came to check the movements of the shadow in order to study the equinoxes and the solstices for their agricultural activities. At the foot of the temple is a cruz cuadrada, a stone cross and an important Inca symbol. The three levels represent the heavens, the present world, and the inner world of Mother Earth, from which all life flows. The weather in the Andes can be harsh and unpredictable. Though the day had been sunny, the afternoon brought cold rain. Now I'm dressed like you. Yeah, but this stuff is warm. <laughs> we decided to camp overnight on the mountain. Yeah, I'm warming up. This helps. The next day we hiked to what seemed to us to be a plateau of shrubs and rocks. What we wondered was the significance of this place. This is the tent place, so let's say this it here. Yep. All right. A closer look told us that these were not stones as nature made them. These were stones that clearly showed the handiwork of the Inca. In these square cutouts stood huge idols, idols which the Spanish toppled and hammered into dust. This place was sacred to the Wari people long before the Inca Empire. This was probably a rock for sacrificing animals. The head of the animal was wedged in a hole and its throat was slit.
Blood drained along a channel where priests scooped it up to drink it to gain powers. Next to the Wari ritual site, the Inca priest once drained the blood of humans in ritual sacrifice. As we know from Spanish records, there were times when human sacrifice was conducted for a religious purpose, quite often uh, having to do with uh, some sort of appeasement uh, to the gods for a change in weather or relief from some uh, uh, particular uh, plague or tragedy that was uh, existing in the region at the time. Adjacent to the sacrificial stones is a place that was the supreme court of the Incas. People accused of crimes were brought here to stand trial. The judges sat on stone seats to the right. Facing them sat the accused. They had a very simple philosophy. Don't be lazy, be honest, and help your neighbor. And anyone who transgressed against those obviously was not uh, a part of the good of the community. And uh, they were punished uh, accordingly. Those who the judges found guilty were taken to a nearby mountain summit and put to death. Even today, this place of death still has a spooky feeling for me, and I was glad uh, when we left. The next day found us in a more comfortable setting, the bustling city of Lima. Romulo told us that Lima was established as a seaport by the Spanish, a place they could use to ship looted Inca treasure to Spain. Today, it is a modern city of millions. In the very heart of Lima, Peru, in the midst of the fashionable high-rent district of San Isidro, is one of the most ancient temple complexes and burial sites in all of the Americas. This is Huyamarca, only recently found and still in the process of being uncovered. Even at this early point in the excavation, one could identify temples and a pyramid made entirely of adobe bricks. We were shown around by Dr. Valladolid, who heads the excavation team. You know, the most amazing thing about this place isn't necessarily the temples and pyramids, but the fact that the ancient people who lived here, the keepers of the temples, are still here. Mummies in good condition, preserved in one large burial pit. When we opened it, we found an elderly woman, approximately 65 years of age. You will see that she is wrapped in cloth. This mummy was discovered just days before our arrival. We were the first to photograph it. In one burial pit alone, 128 mummies were found, all women, all in a fetal position, all facing north, the traditional source of life. Here were found tools for weaving and cooking, but not a single weapon. We can determine that this area was a ceremonial center from approximately 200 BC. After being abandoned, they used it as a cemetery. This particular mummy, now in a museum, was probably worshipped for centuries before it was finally buried. This mummy was discovered in Hualamarca. This is very important because she was found with no preservation. She's exactly as we found her. Her six-foot-long braids and many adornments show that she was a woman of high status, perhaps a priestess, perhaps an oracle. Fifteen miles south of Lima, nearly lost beneath blowing sands from the beaches below, is the huge pyramid and temple complex sacred to the creator goddess Pachacamac. This is the Temple of the Sun, once one of the most revered and holy sanctuaries 
of the Andean peoples. The chosen women who lived here were believed to be able to predict the future. For 2,000 years, people brought gold and silver in return for prophecies. An enormous treasure was said to have been collected, a treasure that was very enticing to the conquering Spanish. Again, we saw recesses set in the walls, platforms for Inca idols. When pilgrims came here to ask about the future, it said they walked backward to the idols and heard voices which sounded like hissing. Obviously, the Inca had a way to make their voices sound as if they came from the stone idols. At every site, we seemed to find a stone pit, the collection site for the blood of human sacrifice. The Spanish had come here to loot the temple's fabled treasure. Soldiers charged up the steps of the temple and forced the priest to open the door to a sacred room at the top, the Holy of Holies. But all they found was a statue of the goddess Pachacamac. The Spanish replaced the idol with a cross and in one stroke brought to an end the 2,000 year history of this sacred place. It's very possible that the priests had enough time to hide the treasure of Pachacamac somewhere under these shifting sands. Was there a treasure? If there was, it is now lost, probably lost forever. We couldn't seek out Inca sacred sites without coming to the lost city of the Incas, Machu Picchu. Built high on a mountain peak, accessible only by a steep, narrow trail. This place is so old that it may have been lost even to the Inca themselves before the arrival of the Spanish. Even after the Spanish expansion from their coastal enclaves and eventual domination of, of this entire region, they never discovered Machu Picchu. There are no remnants of roadways leading to Machu Picchu, uh, which leads you to conclude that the common man were excluded from this place. It was a city of kings and priests. Many theories have been put forth about the importance of Machu Picchu since its discovery almost 100 years ago. The one thing that we do know that clearly marks it as an extremely important site is the Intihuatana, the hitching post of the sun, the obelisk used by the priestly class to forecast the seasons. Western history books say that in 1911, an American archaeologist named Hiram Bingham rediscovered the city buried under jungle vines and trees. But Romulo has a different story. The true discoveries of Machu Picchu are not recognized in many books. At the beginning of this century, my great uncle, Don Agustin Lizarraga, he found a narrow trail. So, walking the trail, the young Agustin Lizarraga found the Machu Picchu city. Even the Peruvian government recognized only to Hiram Bingham as a discoverer of Machu Picchu. If Romulo is right, it would not have been the first time that the recognition owed to a native was claimed by a Westerner instead. It's obviously a place of great beauty and a place of spiritual significance, but I notice that my Western mind's eye has a tendency to drift more towards the facts about the place rather than what the people who build it and the people who live here feel deeply in their heart. The next morning we set up with Romulo to a remote cave in the high country. As we climbed, Romulo explained that for the Quechua, Caves are sacred to the spirits of the underground world, friendly spirits, responsive to prayer and to offerings. During the long trek further and further away from civilization, it became obvious that we were headed to a secret hidden place.
We entered the cave quietly, trying not to disrupt the ritual, which was already in progress. When Romulo acknowledged the mother goddess Pachamama and his own Quechua roots, we were permitted to stay. This looked like a healing ceremony, though later Romulo told us that it was supposed to give fertility to a woman who wanted another child. Cocoa leaves are a holy intoxicant, a traditional way to remove the healer's spirit from this world and lift it to a higher plane. We never found out whether the spirits of the underground world accepted the offering and gave the woman her child. Not far from the cave are several mysterious formations known as the Moray Circles. Archaeologists believe that this was an agricultural site for the Inca, a place to experiment with the best growing conditions for different crops. The Quechua have a different explanation. Every circle has seven terraces. Number seven represents the seven sisters stars on the sky, the seven chakras of our bodies, or the seven colors of the rainbow. Those circles are really very old pre-Incan constructions. Who knows when those circles were built a long time ago. The circles give us the best energy. We went there in order to encourage ourselves and our spirits. The middle circle is said to be the focus of spiritual energy. Here Quechua healers perform rituals and make offerings as they have for hundreds and perhaps thousands of years. This ceremony honors the mother goddess. As always, cocoa leaves bring the healers closer to the spirits. The offerings are wrapped carefully, then placed in the fire. The offering rises upon the smoke into the spirit world. These Quechua holy men had traveled from their village, actually for days, down to this very special location so that they could give offering to Pachamama on behalf of the local farmers for relief from the drought that had stricken the area. Their sincerity was very obvious and really beyond words. Lines. The mysterious lines cut into a thin strip of desert west of the Andes. You have to fly above the Nazca lines to really make them out. The fact that they're almost impossible to follow on ground level is one of the great mysteries. 
How and why did people create figures which can only be seen from the air? There are many theories about the lines, everything from landing sites to pictures of the ancient gods. This is very alluring archaeology. Everyone wants to be the first to prove the origin of the lines. Eric von Doniken uh, and others have uh, put forth a theory that these were proof of some alien uh, extraterrestrial uh, visitation sometime in the past. Who knows? Some believe that they represent constellations and their alignment with the stars determined planting times, a sort of celestial calendar, not unlike Stonehenge. Or perhaps they were offerings to the heavens, made only to be seen by the gods looking down from above. These long straight lines may have been pilgrim paths to ceremonial sites, sites long lost from memory. It's, it's, it's my belief that uh, we'll never have a clear answer to this one. I think it's probably a good thing for all of us that uh, some of these things will remain unanswered and challenge us uh, forever. We've been told that before we left the Andes, we should see one of the most sacred sites of all, but getting there would not be easy. At first, it just seemed like a pleasant ride in the Andes. But soon it became the ride from hell. The road, sometimes paved, but more often covered with rocks and dug up with holes, winded its way up and up into the thin air. For those who aren't born here, even breathing can be a chore. We came here with Jose, a journalist and descendant of the Aymara people who built these sites. Zach, this is the Apacheta. This is the place where most of us celebrate uh, ceremonies in honor of Pachamama and uh, Achachilas. We were headed for the Apachita, ancient shrines hidden in distant, hard to reach places. Worshippers of the mountain spirits came here in ancient times, leaving stones to mark their visit. The stones became piles, and the piles became monuments. Sacred sites where offerings were made. We found out that just getting there can be risky. The divine lords of the mountains are the most powerful of all the Andean deities, so powerful that only the most experienced priests can deal with them directly. The Apacheta is like an open church where you can be in touch with elderly good spirits. They are always taking care of us, but we have to always pay respect to them. So what we're gonna see is basically the same kind of ceremony that's been going on for the last, uh, well, thousand years or perhaps longer than that. It's been hundreds and thousands of years that Aymaras have been visiting these places to pay respect. A Yatiri prepared an offering to the mountain spirit. He blessed Jose and dedicated the offering to the spirits on our behalf. A mistake in the ritual or prayer incorrectly spoken is said to bring harm to the worshiper.
Even a cigarette became a part of the ceremony. The fire transforms the offering into spirit form and carries it to the mountain lords. We think that Mother Nature, Pachamama, needs to be worshipped, and that's why we celebrate ceremonies in honor of her, which doesn't mean that we do not admit the existence of God. We think Pachamama is God's most generous expression because she's the one who gives us life. The fact that we are still coming here that the ceremonies are still being held is the perfect proof that this culture and tradition is still going on. I mean, it still exists, no matter the uh, different cultural influences we've been exposed to. The cross, the most recognized symbol in all Christendom, was integrated into the old religion, and Christ became another powerful spirit. Nearly hidden beneath the Christian offerings of flowers is the evidence of animal sacrifice, worship that continues today. Will these people be able to maintain their ancient religious beliefs, not under an onslaught of conquest now, but I'm afraid that modern technology and this, what I call homogenized culture, will probably drive these ancient beliefs either completely away or to smaller and smaller pockets much more quickly than any conqueror ever could. Does the world of the Inca still exist? Here in the Andes, the spirit can still be felt. In the sacred sites and ancient ceremonies which bind the Andean peoples of today with the great and glorious past of their Inca ancestors.